Ladies and gents, we have a special guest today. You'll see her flamboyantly in the background there. She lost 50 pounds on a plant-based diet whilst raising kids. And she's now spreading her amazing message of health and positivity. I always call her the happiest person I've ever met, which is true, by the way. You're the happiest person I've ever met. Uh, and now she's helping tens of thousands of people online. So uh, a virtual round of applause to the one, the only, uh, Tia from Healthy Vegan Mama. Thank you, Tia, for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're very, very welcome. We'll dive straight into it. Um, what I want to know, because this is something I see a lot of people saying, Ryan, I'm interested in a plant-based diet. Ryan, I'm thinking about going vegan. Or maybe it's more from a weight loss center. Maybe they're not interested in plant-based diets. But every, every couple of weeks, I have someone tell me, oh, yeah, I want to lose some weight. And I look them in the eyes, and they don't really mean it. So what I wanted to ask you is, how long has it been since you first, or how long was it since you first got interested, you first heard of a plant-based diet and it caught your attention, mm -hmm. to the first time you actually said, right, I better take action on this. How long was that length of time? Do you remember? I, I do. It was almost a decade. Um, yeah. And I always talk about this and part of me regrets saying that because I don't want people to hear that and think like, oh, this is, help this is pointless for me. Mm -hmm. But I think it's so important that I do mention that because... Um, we all go through, I think, moments in life where things seem difficult and we try to do it and we give up. And anyway, I eventually got it. But um, yeah, it was it was about a decade. Um, I, I know I was pregnant with my son. He's nine. Mm. So maybe not quite a decade, but um, I was pregnant with my son when I first came across Forks Over Knives. And that's when I like my eyes were completely open and I was like. I'm so doing that, this. So that was at the start of that 10-year period. That was the first time you really got into it. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think with that sort of length of time, like I think there's a certain period of time where people need to almost warm themselves up before they begin transitioning to more. Yeah. Um, but do you think at some point that then actually it starts going the other way and you actually start really putting it off and you've got actually through the transition period but because you never take action, it actually gets worse and worse. Then it's another couple of months, another year or two. When do you think that was, when it went too far and you were like, oh my goodness? Well, I'm the type of person, as you know, because you were my coach, um, I like to jump like right in something. I'm not a little like dabbler. So no. when I watch Forks Over Knives, and now granted, I'm like six months pregnant and I had just been diagnosed with gestational diabetes. So that's kind of what got me um, searching for health, like documentaries on Netflix. Cause I was like, what is going on? Like nobody in my family has had diabetes or gestational diabetes. Why is, why is this happening to me? So, um, anyway, I saw it and I'm like, I'm, I'm doing this And my, of course my OBGYN at the time was like, this is not a good idea. You know, you have gestational diabetes, you should be eating meat, dairy, eggs, no carbohydrates to keep your blood sugars low. But right after I had my son, so so I had a newborn, yeah. which is hard enough. Um, I was like, I'm going, I'm going vegan, you know. And at this time, I didn't quite understand. What year is this? Just for a bit of context, because I'm this, thinking how long I met you in first in 2019, I think. So yeah, when... this is 20. Um, I mean, he was born in 2013. Mm -hmm. So this is either the end of 2012 or the beginning of 2013. Mm -hmm. um, so. What was I saying? Um, oh yeah, so I so I have a newborn, and I'm like I am I am doing this, and at this point I didn't quite understand the difference between being a vegan and eating a plant based diet. So mm -hmm. I like went out to the store because remember I like jumped right in. I bought all the processed vegan stuff, everything to make my life you know easy. Um, I have a newborn, so I feel like this, I'm just feeling very, everything's chaotic at home. It's not the same. And then here I am eating this totally new way, um, that my husband wasn't eating. And anyway, to answer your question, it just seemed very complicated for me. Yeah. Um, and that's when things started to just kind what, of unravel. What was complicated in hindsight? What, was, what, were, you, what were you getting confused about? Well, I wasn't getting any healthier. And I think that's because I was eating all the vegan, mm. you know, food, prepackaged foods. And I wasn't losing any baby weight. Um, and because of that, I started to realize, like, th this isn't easy. 
Like I, I have to, my husband is hungry and I have this baby I have to feed and then I have to eat differently. So the complicated thing was that we were all eating differently. I was a new mom. Mm. Um, and what I thought would help me wasn't, um, mm. but as time went on, I realized it's because of the way I was eating a vegan diet. <laughs> but at the time then were you, because obviously we can now look back in hindsight, we can now go, well, obviously you were doing it wrong, Tia. You didn't know it's obvious, right? You're having all the vegan <laughs> junk foods, right? You didn't, you were new to it, so you didn't have all the info you needed. The internet was in its infancy. YouTube was in its infancy. So there wasn't that much info on this. Like being vegan was still very, very, it still is now, but it was super niche 10 years ago. Yeah. So it's obvious why you struggled with it previously. But at the time, did you really believe, no, I'm doing everything right? Why isn't this, were you tearing your hair out? Or was it obvious yeah. with the junk at the time? as well i was tearing my hair out i thought right. i was doing it right. right i thought i was doing it right it's that... funny and then after that my husband was like let's um we watched another documentary you know it's it's funny it was just documentary after documentary we just felt like i was trying to find something that i knew was missing i, I was trying to find something an easy way you know and um we came across some documentary about juicing. And so we were like, okay, the vegan thing's not working. Let's just juice. We're going to, we're going to detox for, for, for a month. We're just going to juice. I mean, I mean, we, we lasted two days. We were starving. Um, it was just one thing after another for years. You said you were looking for something easy. I want to offer another explanation. Was it a magic pill? That yeah, you that's what I, yeah, that's, exactly what I should have said. I wanted, yes, I, I felt like there was something I was missing out there, like a magic pill that I just was missing. It had to have been easier than this. You know, I was watching the documentary and all these people on Fork Server Knives who were transformed and healthy. And then, you know, you, I read books about people who went vegan and got really healthy and just, it wasn't happening for me. Um, but the point you, and in hindsight, I suppose, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but presumably the point you missed was, oh no, these people on Fox Cinema over knives, they've not just gone vegan, they're actually eating whole plant foods. Yes. And at some point you discovered that, presumably. Yes. Yeah. yeah, probably about like four years later. <laughs> well, it's like 2017 now, you're like, okay. So it's yeah. not fair to say you didn't hear this plant-based message and then think, oh, that sounds cool, and then just park it for 10 years. You were or five, let's say five or six years until about 2019, 2020, when you really broke through, which we'll talk about in a second. But it was, you were flirting with it. You were going through presumably phases throughout the year where you were giving it a shot and then sort of going back again to meat and dairy or mm -hmm. always that you, you were able to do the vegan thing, but never sort of clean up your diet so much. No, I would go back to meat and dairy because it yeah. just, it seemed too complicated um, mm -hmm. being vegan. So mm -hmm. I, in a, in a heavy meat and dairy family and society. It was like, this is too difficult for me. Um, I also, let me say this, I think what also made it really hard for me was I was very afraid of carbohydrates. Right. Because I had spent decades dieting since like 12 years old. I hate admitting that. And I was, you know, all brainwashed that I wasn't supposed to eat carbohydrates. And so imagine being afraid of carbs and then moving over to a very carb heavy way of life. I mean, I was starving, you know, cause once I realized like, oh man, I shouldn't be eating this processed stuff. Let me stick to whole plant foods. Like a couple of years later when I realized that yeah. I was staying away from the beans, the potatoes, <laughs> the rice. And I literally was, it yeah. seems like just eating like, you know, broccoli, all these non-starchy veggies, lettuce and fruit. And I, you can't, I mean, I guess some people can, but for me, I couldn't sustain that way of eating. And so once again, um, in my mind, I'm like, this is not working for me. And so I went back to meat and dairy and just continued to have lots of health problems throughout this, you know, I keep saying decade, but it was probably like six or seven years throughout this time, you know, I am continuing to have health problems. The right. gestational diabetes went away when I had, when I had my son, but I, I started to, my high cholesterol came back. I was now considered pre-diabetic. Mm. I was at risk for um, getting diabetes sometime in the future. I um, started having gallbladder issues. I mean, all kinds of things. I had skin cancer, melanoma, like all mm. these things. And I don't mean to laugh, but it's just kind of like all these things kept popping up. 
Is no, you're laughing. Going you're on. laughing because it's not funny, but it's it's the idea that there's one thing after another, which I know yeah. a lot of people experience. Yeah. So, for you, do you think this is a really interesting question about people's motivations? Because I've noticed this. Do you think? Do you think the fact there were so many like little health scares? Oh, I say little health scares, but health scares every couple of months or every couple of years. Do you think that made you more keen to go and like, oh, I've got to solve this. I've got to do something. This plant-based thing yeah. kept coming back to it. Whereas if you weren't having all those things, you'd have had your son, the diabetes went away. Do you think you'd have just relaxed then maybe? Do you think it was the fact mm -hmm. you had so many little scares popping up that kept you, mm, I've got to do something here. I've got to go back to this. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I didn't, I probably would have kept eating low carb or doing whatever mm -hmm. I was doing, which, which would work for such a small time. And then it, you know, it was like a yo-yo. So, but yeah, to answer your question, I probably wouldn't have kept coming back. Yeah. Um, but I did because I knew what I heard was the truth. It made sense to me. It made sense, you know? And so, yeah. It, it resonated with you enough that you kept coming back, even though it wasn't working. It's not that you gave it one shot. And I think that's a great thing that anyone watching who's been sort of flirting with plant-based eating or, or taking the step to go vegan, whether for ethically or for health reasons, I think you're a great example of what, where it's, it's never too late. Right? Mm -hmm. you're playing with it. I mean, you're still a young person now, but you were playing with this for a long time. You were flirting with this for a very, very long yeah. time. And it wasn't sort of seven or eight years in. So we say a decade. It's a decade until now that you were first interested. But seven or eight years in, when you actually started to master this, like that's quite a, I don't mean to sound condescending, but that's quite a long period of time versus my journey, which was like a month. And so I think it's really important for people to know that about you. And you're now somebody that is like a figurehead in this movement. It's really important that they know that you that is your story. And it actually took you a long time to fully transition. And I think that's what I was trying to say at the beginning, which I think made no sense, was that sometimes I'm a little apprehensive to say it took me so long. Right. Because I don't want to scare people. I don't want people to think that's going to happen for them. Because a lot of people who want to eat this way want to change quickly. Um, and I don't blame them. But I do think it's important for me to mention because there are so many people out there like me um, and it is never too late. And mm. once it once it clicks and you find what works for you, which is pretty important, um, at least it was for me, then that's it. It's just it's so easy or it, it has been easy. Um, well, let's talk about then, that then. So fast forward to, as you said, 2017, 2018 now. And you'd struggled with it up until this point, but your head was still in the game, still kept coming back to this, still thinking, yep, yeah, this is the answer for me. The plant-based message was resonating with you. What was the tipping point or what changed in, in those couple of years to whereby you were like, okay, here's what I need to do now? Yeah, I came across um, High Carb Hannah mm -hmm. and, and she talked about um, the Stark Solution and Dr. McDougall. And when I... Sorry, you'd seen all the documentaries at this point anyway. You'd, you'd consume yes. that. I saw yeah. What the Health. I saw um, Forks Over Knives. Um, some of the other ones I had seen. But I still was afraid of carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And then when I when I came across High Carb Hanna and I read The Starch Solution, it was like my mind was blown. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I finally understood. It's, it, it's, it's all whole plants, which I think I was kind of understanding. But I'm like, I can eat carbs and I understood why carbs get such a bad rap you know I, I kind of started to understand it's not the carbs we need the carbs we need that for energy it's all the crappy fat we're putting on it and so uh, once I read the starch solution I was like whoa this is it I am changing and I I again jumped right in um but still kind of struggled mm. and uh but you, I, is that called you up <laughs> Yeah, we'll get to that. Is that for you then? Was that the missing piece of the puzzle? Looking back, it was the carb component. And before that, whether you even had the language for this or not, you were maybe trying to do almost like a plant based keto thing or a yes. vegan keto thing, which mm -hmm. occasionally on Instagram I see someone that's doing that, but it's so hard to do because so many carb foods, uh, excuse me, plant foods are rich in carbohydrates, as you know. Yeah. Um, and that's not when it's from a whole food source, that's not the red flag that many people think it is. Um, so for you, that was the missing piece of the puzzle. It was getting permission to eat good, clean carbohydrate. We want to stress that. We're not talking about soda and, and okay. no, no, no. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking about potatoes and rice and beans and um, 
occasional pasta and maybe some bread, but yeah, yeah. The, the good clean carbs, I guess pasta and bread's not clean, but yeah. Um, that was a big part Sorry. for me. That's okay. That was a big part for me. Um, so when you got that information, when you read the start solution, you got that blessing to eat carbs, did the weight fall off then or what happened? What was the, the next sort of step of your journey? It didn't um, because, because I still, you know, boy, I tell you, the diet culture really screwed up my mind uh, because I still didn't understand that I needed to be in a calorie deficit. I just thought I could, you know, and we, you have mentioned this so many times, we, we hear this a lot, but I thought I could just eat whole plant foods and lose weight as much as I want. Um, and it just, it wasn't the case. And, you know, so I was dealing with that thought that I could just eat as much as I wanted. Um, I also had a lot of emotional and mental ties to food. We've talked about this like a lot um, just throughout, just from years and years and years of dieting. And, and um, so that kind of messed me up too. You know, I, I needed, I knew I needed help in that sense and someone to kind of push me along in the right direction until I got on my feet. Um, but yeah, those were the two big things, I think. Mm, understood. Emotional ties to food. I've got a couple of questions mm -hmm. about that later. So we'll mm -hmm. definitely come to that. And I suppose, I suppose one of those emotional ties or limiting beliefs, at least, is that carb issue again. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you think there's something going back to what you said about calories there? Because it's spot on. Do you agree with my, because you've heard me say it many times, that in this vegan plant-based space, it's almost like we underemphasize calories. Now, I think the mainstream health world, they it go, calories are talked about constantly to the point where it's irritating to people. And so I think what's attractive about, part, partly what's attractive about the plant-based message to people is they hear that they maybe don't have to worry about calories and it makes the plant-based message even more attractive to them. I'm sure mm -hmm. there are several reasons for coming over, but it makes it seem more important. And I think, therefore, it gets sort of un underemphasized by people in this community. I don't know if it's teachers. I don't know if it's maybe the teachers are emphasizing calories, but people in their audience aren't really picking up on that message. Whoever is to blame here, I'm not pointing the finger, but do you agree with my uh, emphasis that it doesn't get talked about enough, or do you disagree with that? Um, for That's sure. That's a tough question, I know. No, no, for sure. Well, I think it has two parts. I think, like, the people who... I think there's such a big push for plant-based just for health reasons. And I think they don't talk about calories because it's not like, it's not front and center. Like they just want people to move over to get healthy finally. Um, but in the, in the weight loss arena of plant-based, yeah, it, it, there is this theme of just, just eat plants and you'll, you'll lose weight. And for many people they do. And that's awesome. Because when you're coming from a diet so full of meat and dairy and all these um, rich calorie foods, and then you move over to plants that have kind of just naturally lower calories. Yeah. I mean, some people do drop weight. The thing oh. with me was I wasn't, even though I wasn't fully plant-based, I still wasn't eating a lot of meat. I never drank milk my whole life. So it, it wasn't a huge jump for me. Yeah. And so I still really didn't lose much weight. I might have lost some water weight. and um, So after the start solution, you didn't really have a, a drastic breakthrough. So this is like 2017, 2018. You didn't really have a major breakthrough? No, but to be fair, yeah. it was because I wasn't, I think, consistent. If, I, if yeah. I can bring that up. It's because I was expecting to go on the start solution and to be five pounds less mm. in a week. And if I wasn't... I would, I'd say, oh, I need, I need, I need to do something else. This isn't working. And you and I both know now that yeah, that's not time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was my problem. Again, I was still so brainwashed with the dieting culture that I was looking for quick and easy and, and that, that wasn't happening. And, you know, oh. even when I signed up with you for coaching, I mean, you and I looking at my, my weight loss chart, I mean, I didn't lose a lot of weight in the beginning. No. Um, no. And if I didn't, you know, and if, and I, straight away, yeah. Yeah, and if I didn't have you, and I knew I needed you, I I would have given up, like I had done before. You know, I. Well, let's not get too far ahead. Let's stay on on the journey. Sorry, I had to mention it. Did you? No, no. It's really it's important because these are 
things that you're seeing as being breakthrough moments. So mm -hmm. 2017, 2018, first major breakthrough moment, read the start solution, got the clarity you needed, but still because you weren't super consistent, didn't really break through. We met in, I think our first conversation, I'm sure was December, 2019. So very late in 2019. Mm -hmm. And then, so I really think about meeting you in 2020, but technically it was December. You didn't lose a couple of pounds between reading the start solution a year or two before and me. You yep. presumably went up and down the scale a little bit, but overall net weight loss, nothing substantial. No, and I think actually right before I uh, reached out to you, I had gone back to the standard American diet because I was like, this isn't, this isn't what I thought. It's not working. You know, I don't know what's going on. Do you remember our first, how much do you remember our first conversation? Because there's still bits of it I can remember walking around on my kitchen because it was before I even talked on Zoom and I just spoke to you on WhatsApp, hands, hand, hand, uh, what is it, hands free, just uh -huh. walking around my kitchen talking to you. Because I'm one of those people, when I'm on the phone, I can't sit still, I have to pace around, it helps me think. Do you remember much of that or not really? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I remember where I was because I was, I just remember I have such a good memory, first of all. But second of all, I was just so excited that I was finally taking control of this situation. Finally. Yeah, um, yeah but I do remember. I remember it was very long. Um, <laughs> probably because I'm not also, I was very, through this, so I don't know. Yeah. Yes, I was very willing to give you all the information because I just wanted good. to wanted to do this. Um, but I do remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I remember a lot of, and this is going to sound like I'm blowing my own trumpet. I'm, <laughs> you have to believe I'm not saying it for this reason, but you were just like, oh my God, like everything. I'd say something, and you're like, oh, that's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's me. We we just connected. And I think, I think through my journey with emotional eating, I could, even though there were different sort of reasons for our emotional eating, I think you could see that we were similar. And you, that's probably when you realized, okay, he can help me. Yeah. Okay. Not to put words in your mouth, but yeah. No, it's true. It's so true. Also, well, and I also knew that too, real quick. Just, and I want to say this too. I had mentioned I came across High Carb Hannah, and that's when I realized stuff. I also came across your channel, and I had been watching you for probably a year. Um, because didn't you get my book first, or something like? Didn't you get? I remember talking to you on Instagram. Didn't you get one of my book, my mindset book first? Before I signed book? up with you, yeah. But yeah. I had been watching you for a while. And that's why I, I reached out to you because I knew just from your videos and the way that you seemed at least, because we're not always what we seem, but I knew, I was like, this guy I, I feel like can really help me. Mm -hmm. um, and sure enough, yeah, when we talked, I was like, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> my, my perception as well is, like you asked, as I said at the start, and I wasn't joking, you are the world's happiest person, <laughs> but you must be in the top 10. You are so positive. <laughs> And I, I've even seen you in the darker moments over the last couple of years, and you're still really positive, even when yeah. something isn't going well for you. The way you reframe things, I've got a lot of time for how you, your attitude, even when things aren't going for you, I've got a lot of time for you, you know that. But um, oh, I've lost my train of thought in complimenting you over the, in an over-the-top manner. Um, what was I going to say, T? Um, we were talking about just when we first talked and, um, you know, the Stark Solution... I wasn't, that's what we're talking about. I wasn't losing weight. Yeah. You know? Between coming across that and signing up with you, I still wasn't losing weight. And I went back to the standard American diet and I had a massive gallbladder attack. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. And then I knew I need to change now or I'm going to have surgery and I'm going to have my gallbladder out. And then it's just going to be other things. Was this right before we met then literally in the month before? Yeah. Cause I do remember talking about it, but I can't remember the, the sort of timeline of everything. I mean, it might've been like two weeks, a week. Right. It was quick. How do you, so how do you see, because you, you are right. Like weight loss was tricky at times when you were working with me. And I think you had your first plateau about week three or four. I remember it towards the end of January, which is quite early to have a plateau. But I think even on my program now, the average client, will hit two plateaus with me. So it's not unheard of, but it, I always think it's quite unfortunate when a client hits one fairly early on because it can be a little bit demoralizing. Whereas when it's later in your journey, you're already a bit more mature. You're a bit more sort of, you focused on the longevity. It's a bit hard at first when someone plateaus right away. I think when you came on board with me, you did have an initial weight loss in the first two weeks, but then it did sort of stop. For you, those first couple of weeks, what were your reflections? Why did whatever I asked you to do, whatever we did as a team, why did that work compared to what you were doing before? What was the difference maker? Do you think it was that calorie thing? Oh, I think I was just 
sticking with it and being consistent. Consistency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's for sure what it was. I could, I'd lay money down. Like that's for sure what it was. So you went from, I mean, how many days a week were you consistent before me versus after me, do you think? Three, okay. two, because I'd get on the scale every day. And if it wasn't changing or it wasn't going the way I wanted, I, I would mentally like just be devastated and talk myself out of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I was just really consistent with you. You know, you held me accountable and, and I, and that's, I started to realize like the importance of consistency in everything in life, not just dieting or weight loss or, I mean, with everything that someone wants to accomplish, I, I really started realizing, wow, like consistency pays off. Someone That's the thing. Yeah, it, it's so true. And it's maybe cliche, consistency is key. You hear it all the time. But if you hear it all the time, why don't people do it? Because it's not, we're not saying anything profound here. It's not rocket science. Wow, consistency is important. People might be listening to this going, well, of course, Tia, of course, Rai, consistency is important. We know that. Why don't people do it then if they know it? Well, I didn't do it because I was, again, brainwashed, thinking that there was some magic pill or magic trick or magic diet mm. that I could get on and lose weight quickly. So I didn't need consistency. So I thought consistency was just a load of bull that some people would say. Right. Well, you know? how did you escape that then? What did you do right that, that stopped you always jumping to the next magic pill? Wait, what say that changed? again? Something must have changed in your mind to stop you jumping to the next magic pill. Well, I just, I just saw with my own eyes, I experienced mm -hmm. the benefits of being consistent thanks to you. I mean, obviously, yes, I could have probably at some point done it on myself, by myself, but I think that's one of the reasons why I signed up with you is because I knew I needed someone there. I needed someone to talk me off the ledge when I was, and I know many times, especially in the beginning, I would, I would, <laughs> I would, um. I would WhatsApp, you know, message you and just say, Ryan, I'm like, I'm feeling like this is not going well. And you would message back and say, just stop thinking about it and just keep pushing through. And sure enough. Here we are. You yeah. were right. <laughs> no, well, I can't take the credit for it. You did the work and you were such a good person to work with. You just so... I said it to you before and it doesn't sound like a compliment, but you're so coachable, which doesn't sound like a really... Uh, 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 like a... a flattering thing to say really but you were you were just so like okay i'll do it you're such a and i think as well, you're such a, a, a an action step follower when i gave you instructions you were like bang yeah consider it done and since i've known you outside of just like our weight loss conversations a couple of years ago i've seen that in you in other areas as well you're such an action taker but i think the other thing that and this is one of those when i had that brain fog earlier when i lost my train of thought i remember what it was i think another thing that made us connect well is probably the directness in with in which we both appreciate people speaking to us. Yeah, I don't know if you also felt the same. Yeah, yeah. I, I struggle with people who don't just tell me. Down the bush. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah I, I agree. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then fifty pounds gone. Obviously, we're speeding ahead now. Fifty pounds gone. But I think some people, when they hear that, they go, "Wow, that's such a startling amount." And they see you before and after photos. We know because we've both done it. It isn't actually as amazing as it sounds because it doesn't go, it, you don't lose two pounds, uh, five pounds, excuse me, in January, another five in February, another five in March. It, it's never usually that smooth. It's up, down, up, down. Mm -hmm. So if you can tell us, like, after you did my program, like, how much do you remember losing with me? And then until the 50 pounds, like, just a, a just a, a 30 seconds on sort of the timeline of it, just so we can just this a bit, but it's linear. Yeah. Um. I lost, I lost a few 20, 20, I think 20 pounds, right? Maybe like 22 pounds. Something and then like I think at that point, I just knew if I stayed consistent and kept doing what you taught me and just, it would come off and it did. Now there were moments where I hit a plateau, I think around like 35 pounds, I hit a plateau, but I knew what to do. And I knew it wasn't the end of the world and I knew I could figure it out. And, and I did. And um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. But. Of course it does. Of course it does. Yeah, I think that's the point I, I was tr trying to get from your answer and uh, help people at home understand. I think a lot of people know this themselves, so maybe it's not that amazing a point to highlight, but it doesn't go like this. It's like, whoa, it yeah. is a roller coaster at times, but as long as you're on the downward trend overall, happy days. Yeah, oh. and there were many days where I'd get on the scale and I was 
um, 160. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, I am 160. Because I think with you, I started at like 180. And then the next day I would get on the scale and I would be 162. Yeah. But I knew, you know, I learned that there are natural fluctuations, especially with females in that, you know, one day, yes, it might be 160 and then 162, but the next day it would be 159, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there were up and downs, but, but yes, I just kept overall going down. Um, I remember. I remember at one point. I don't know if you remember this. I actually drew a graph for you. You know what I'm going to say. Yes, yeah, I don't know how much you're happy with me sharing this. I'll stop talking if you want me to. No, I love it. Um, but I drew a graph of what happened to your weight during your menstrual cycles, and I think you. I don't want to put again. Don't want to put words in your mouth. But I, th I remember you responding quite positively, positively to that, and it just helped you. I think stay cool and mm -hmm. patient when when you are having fluctuations. Yeah. You see, oh, it matches the water retention from PMS. Oh, for sure. And, and we know just from coaching and other coaching you and I have done, like I, for some reason, retain yeah. so much water for so yeah. long. For so long. That's it. For it's so not just the water. Long. It's, it's, it's much, it, your, it's, your PMS seems to be prolonged, or the water retention at least. So prolonged. And then quite the opposite of most women, but on the day that I do actually um, get my period, I lose weight. Yeah. I lose like four pounds. And most it's women usually lose like it. day three of menstruation when I see it drop with most of my. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's so weird. But, but yes, I feel like tracking my weight and you doing that for me really, again, was just like a mind like clearing. I, I just felt so much um, clarity. Like it made sense. Whereas prior, you know, before coaching with you and not being consistent, like any little bitty fluctuation, which is normal, I'd freak out, you know, mm -hmm. and I would think whatever I was doing wasn't working. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> to come back to the carbs, because we talked about the carb phobia and how you were able to get over that, but how long did it take you to get over that? Because even when you read the start solution, even when you hear me, when you start working with me and, and you hear me saying, no, it's OK, like have this amount of carbs with your meals. Even when you hear that, I'm guessing there's still a bit of like a nervousness. That was not with me. I was so yeah. excited. <laughs> and I trusted okay. I trusted the process. So I was I literally let go. And that's another thing. I mean, I think it's different for everybody. But for me. If I'm going to do something, I am I, I am fully sold on it, a hundred percent. Like, and there is no looking back. So mm -hmm. for me, I I wasn't nervous about it at all. Mm -hmm. um, I was ready, and I knew it was going to work. Mm -hmm. um, that's what, what I meant. <laughs> when I said coachable earlier. That's exactly what I mean. Your trust in me made you so such a pleasure to work with because mm -hmm. you were just again it sounds so funny it sounds like i'm almost being manipulative but it's you were so compliant which sounds like an awful <laughs> thing to say but you were you you just bought into what we were doing so much that you didn't question anything and you just acted with conviction even in the tough times and ultimately mm -hmm. that allowed you to continue even even with the plateaus yeah so you got over the carb phobia another thing that because we talked about the bottom line of consistency for you that was the major thing holding you back and that's what seemed to get better in around sort of 2019 2020 Another thing, aside from the carb phobia that stopped you being consistent, was the emotional eating then. How did you, this is a tricky one, how did you stop using food as a tool to deal with emotions? And I know that's a, a can of worms, but... No, I, I, it's, it's good. I've talked about this a lot. I actually have a video on this. I just replaced food with something else. Okay. Um, so, and, and I'm not saying that was easy at first, but like, instead of me running to food, if I felt, you know, alone or lonely, and I don't mean to say that to make my husband sound horrible because he's <laughs> he is here, he's, I he's not watching, he's there in the background. But I, but I know he's here and he's, oh, he's loving and great. But I think many moms probably sometimes feel alone in their journey of motherhood um, because we do so much for our kids and for our family. So there were many moments where I felt that way and would run to food. And so I, I just realized like, I can't, if I am not really hungry, if I am not really hungry, I need to run to something else. And so I started just running to just a walk around the block. I wasn't saying I'm going to go walk five miles because to me at the time that sounded very overwhelming. I was like, I'm just going to go outside, breathe some fresh air and walk around the block. And I started again to be consistent with that new habit was not easy at first, 
Um, and before I knew it, that's what I would do when I felt um, a lot of emotion is I would go walk. I, I started, I would pick up, you know, one other thing I did, I start pick up, picking up books. I started reading now, or I am a reader now. I like to say that. Um, <laughs> I never was, but I am now. Um, it's funny. If you see a lot of books, like I have a little section where I put books that I've read. Um, if you see it, like all of a sudden there's more books there, it's because I've been feeling very emotional. I'm getting, um, I'm, I'm getting a sense you're quite proud of this. You're dropping a few hints there with your swag, your swagging yeah, job. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, I just replaced the food with something else. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't easy, again, but it it's had to be done. It had to be done. And I had to be disciplined with that to stay consistent. And after about, I would say a week or two, probably more two weeks, um, that was my go-to. I, I think that's what people don't realize is emotional eating, when you turn to food emotionally and you know, cause ignorance is bliss, but when you know that you're turning to food emotionally, you really do feel like you're in the pit of hell because it, it just feels like a cycle that gets worse and worse and worse. And it is in effect because you're training yourself to do it. And you're training yourself that food is the appropriate response to an emotion. And emotions are things we all experience. So it isn't really an appropriate solution, but that's what you train yourself. You program yourself to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what is amazing, what you just said, one to two weeks, not that it's cured or fixed completely in one to two weeks, but people that emotionally, eat, I think they underestimate how long it or yeah, overestimate how long it actually takes to stop feeling so emotionally connected to food. It's just one or two weeks of saying no, and you really start to reprogram yourself more quickly than I think a lot of folks realize. Do you think that was true for you? Did it surprise you how, with a bit of work, how able you were to cut those emotional ties to food in actually a short space of time? Yeah, I think it was It was pretty surprising. Um... I also think I kind of just knew that was what was required. My mom always told me growing up, it takes two weeks to start a new habit, two weeks, you know, anything I do, would do, she would always say, if I would start a new school and I would be nervous, she would say, give it two weeks. Yes. You'll feel, you'll feel it'll be all normal. So, but that's two weeks. always not two weeks. Yeah, it's that's always two weeks is hard though, right? It's, and that's where people stop. It's like going over the proverbial hump. It's like with junk food cravings. There is almost, some yeah. people won't appreciate this metaphor, but there's almost this withdrawal like symptoms for the first sort of five to six to seven days. But once you get over that, I always just want to tell people, look, it gets so much easier. But I think a lot of people don't believe that. They haven't yeah. seen it yet, but you've seen it. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. And I don't want it to sound like, Within those two weeks before, you know, I started really consistently running to walking outside or a book um, when it when I felt emotional. I don't want it to sound like I didn't mess up within those two weeks. Oh. There were one or two times or three times where I ran in the pantry. Um, but I but instead. So what I used to do is when I would do something like that and I would emotional eat, I would just tell myself, well, the rest of the day, I'm going to just go crazy and eat bad all day and then I'll figure it out tomorrow. Mm. But within those two weeks, if I did falter a little bit, I would just get right back on course. I would say, look, we all make mistakes. Start starting over right now. Like we're not waiting till tomorrow. And so that kind of helped too. Um, but yeah, I mean... Do you ever, are there ever moments now where you still look at food you used to enjoy in the past and think, oh, I could have that? Where are you now at with cravings, with emotional eating? Um, I don't, emo I don't old, but is it still there a little bit? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, especially having kids who, you know, eat snacks and like all kinds of, you know, non plant based things. I mean, it might be vegan, but it's not a lot of what they snack on is not plant-based and um yeah i have cravings and you know i don't if i really want a potato chip i have one potato chip like i don't i'm 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 very much so about not depriving myself um i think there was a time where i needed to stick to if i'm not going to eat chips i'm not eating chips not even one mm. But I think now, after three years of maintaining and living this way, I have found um, a happy medium where, I mean, I can have one or two potato chips if it's in front of my face and I want one because I can control myself. You I don't know have to hold back. Like, 
mm. you know, what 15 calories from two chips isn't going to ruin anything, you know, mm. but. But it would um, ruin it if, if, if you t started going through the whole bag, that slippery slope in shoes, but obviously right. you've got way more control now. Yeah. Right. And I also understand consistency, both the good and the bad of it. Right. So I understand if I was to grab two or three chips or four chips every single day or mm -hmm. four times a week consistently, then I probably would see some weight gain or something unhealthy happen to me. So I just, I, I, I get it now. I get it. I understand that I can have one chip or two chips or, mm -hmm. you know, um, as long as I don't make that a habit. I think that's, okay. probably, that's probably very similar to where I've arrived at. I've arrived at a place whereby I think the flexible dieters at one end of the spectrum, those that promote sort of 70% clean eating and then 30% sort of junk foods, I think they're totally wrong. And I think that's not high enough a percentage. But I think the very Puritan clean eaters that literally could never even go to a restaurant to eat and promote that sort of idea, I think they're wrong as well. And I hate using that idea of that word balance because I think a lot of people misuse the word balance. Yeah. Um, and I don't agree with most people's version of a balanced diet, but I think there is a compromise between those two. And I don't know what percentage that is or exactly what that looks like, but certainly let's say you have three meals a day, that's 21 meals a week, certainly one or two of those being a slightly less than clean option, that's not gonna ruin your health. You're still gonna have fantastic results. And is there an argument that therefore that's more practical for you than 21 perfect meals a week? Maybe for some people because of their schedule, their lifestyle, maybe that's a, a more fun and therefore practical way to live. So I think I'm with you. Yeah, I, and I think everybody has to just figure it out for themselves. But yeah. I wanna be clear for me in the beginning because I am such a black and white person, I did not go out to eat. No. I did not steal a chip. Right. I did not, and I stayed that way for quite a long time, um, and I was happy doing that. But it was too that that's the thing. Yeah, I wasn't miserable. I wasn't feeling like right. left out or deprived. Like I was very happy, and um, you know. I think you needed, and this is what I put all of my clients through, I think you needed a period of abstinence to, mm -hmm. to take food off its proverbial pedestal in your mind and to actually learn how to trust yourself with that yes. bag of chips so it didn't go mm -hmm. over the top. And I think as much as I've just said what I've just said, that I think it's okay to occasionally have a meal out, a gl one glass of wine every now and again, and it's not going to ruin your results. And Maybe that makes it practical enough so you can actually imagine staying on track for years and years, for the rest of your life. What am I on about years and years? For the rest of your life, we hope. Um, as much as I've just said that, I actually think a lot of people at first, they need abstinence to earn that flexibility mm -hmm. and to earn that freedom because otherwise you're going to abuse it. Yeah, I agree. I needed to learn what consistency can do. And I needed to learn how to not self-sabotage myself and to not, I needed to do that before I moved to the stage that I'm at now. And, and still the stage that I'm at now, I think some people would be like, wow, like eat a vegan burger, Tia, you're not gonna die. Like I'm still not, you know, I'm still pretty clean, but um, I give myself some, Leeway. Yeah, lean, yeah, leeway every now and then, you know. And and I, it's funny, I was thinking about this in the car yesterday morning. I don't know why, but um, I strive to eat the cleanest diet possible, you know. Are you sure? Uh, yes. However, I, I, you know, and I'm only saying this because I was thinking this. I am living in the year 2023. I'm not living in the year 1123. You know, where there was such a small amount to choose from. I mean, everywhere we go, there's McDonald's and all these horrible foods. And so we we can't expect to be perfect all the time. Um, I don't know why I was thinking that in the car yesterday. No, I think it's a good point. I think it's a but fair it's, point. It's true. I think so many people, I think maybe I had seen something on Instagram about perfection. And I was like, that's just not as much as I want to be. You know, as much as it makes sense, yes, God created all these whole plant foods for us to eat and only eat those things. And uh, I mean, it's still the year 2023 and we have to adapt. And you have to adapt. You, have, you kind of, yeah, as much as there's many things about food culture nowadays that are terrible and you want to shut yourselves away from, you can't stay in bubble wrap forever. You can't do that. No. You need to go out there and you need to be in the real world and, and you need to think about what you can actually adhere to and what you can actually sustain so i'm all for that but here's here's the difficult thing this is where you've struck the right balance and i, I would like to think i have 
is I think a lot of people will hear what we've just said and maybe for them that's permission. Like, oh, because, yes. we, because we live in such a bad time that oh, I'll, I won't even try, I won't even fight it. A lot of people have no resilience and you've become very resilient to the culture. So that's my next follow-up question for you, I suppose, is because we had conversations about this years ago. How do you deal with social events and being around people that do eat differently? And it's okay if someone eats differently, but they then start pushing that onto you or start making comments about what you're doing. How have you learned to deal with that? Um, well, I still bring my own food or eat ahead of time. Um, because, you know, yes, I, yes, I might steal a chip here and there, but I still am pretty black and white. Well, not, but not to a restaurant, though. Um, not to a restaurant, no, but we... Well, not with your family anyway. Mm. No, but if I am with um, people who don't want to eat at a restaurant where there's something for me to eat, right? I will eat ahead of time. Yeah, that makes sense. And I tell them, because they'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Can you? I'm like, don't worry about me. Mm -hmm. I already ate. I'm stuffed. I'll, I'll pick on some chips. If there's chips and salsa, we'll get chips and salsa, or I'll get a salad you know, as boring and cliche as that is for a plant-based dieter, um, you know, I'll get a salad or I, I just, I, my friends know and my family know, like, do not worry about me. If we go to a restaurant and they do have vegan options, amazing. Um, but if not, I, I take care of myself. I am always prepared, always. There's always a backup plan or yeah. you've always eaten something sometimes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. The great thing, though, for me is, though, living in Austin, it is very vegan friendly. Right. So it seems like, so like literally when um, right before Christmas, my parents came in town and they wanted to go to a steak restaurant to celebrate. My daughter had like a piano recital. And I was like, that's fine. I'll eat ahead of time. And we get there and there's like a vegan steak option. I'm like, wait a minute. What, what like, was that made out of then? Well, I think it was like a Salisbury steak. Um, so I ordered it. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't eat it all because I just mm -hmm. knew it was going to be full of fat, but I had it and it was great. So my point is, is that I'm lucky that I live in a city that is very vegan friendly. And I know a lot of people don't have those options. And so, um, if that was me, I'm not saying they need to do this, but if that was me, I would be prepared and eat ahead of time or, um, don't go or you have to go, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's been times I've brought my own food to restaurants, but some no, people good answer. There's, there's lots of good tips there for people watching. So plan yeah. ahead, think ahead and you'll be okay. Be honest um, mm -hmm. and tell people that you, you, you know, when you're going out to meet them, say, look, I've already had something. Don't worry about me. Be honest. I think it's worse when you surprise people. If you turn up to a place and you maybe reject food or say, I'm not eating, that's when people can be a little bit funny. If you've already warned them, you don't surprise them. You've already had the conversation ahead of time. I think that really helps. Stop yeah. the tension, I would say. I do too. What advice do you have? Because I want to remind everyone watching this 50 pound weight loss that you've so brilliantly achieved. That's also happened whilst you've been raising children and not just raising children, raising young children. I think when we, we, we met, your son must have been five or six, perhaps. I think six, yeah. yeah. Um, so what advice would you have to any parents uh, raising young children who want to eat better themselves? Parents who want their kids to eat better? No, that's my second question. So you can answer both. That was my oh, follow-up okay. question. Parents who want to eat better for themselves. themselves. Um, yeah. Absolutely would be to keep things simple. Um, and I think that's how the whole, like for those, those people watching that don't know me, like my whole kind of deal is I eat, very simple, like easy and simple. And I love to show people how they can do that. And that's come about from having small kids um, and having, you know, in my family, not eating a vegan diet right. and um, having to cook for them. And then myself, at first it was, I would say those seven years before actually really doing this, um, that was one of the hiccups I had too, was it was just, I was overcomplicating things so much. So, um, once I, you know, started, I signed up with you and, and just really started going with this whole thing, I realized the importance of keeping things simple. And that's not really hard to do eating whole plant foods. It's so easy. It's so easy. Yeah. So just, I, I would recommend not... You're forced. Huh? The, difference, the difference with you is 
you didn't come into this thinking, oh, I need to make everything simple. It was actually a lesson you learned through mistakes. It was actually mm-hmm. realizing, oh, no, I'm going to, if I want to make this work for me and also feed my family, I'm going to need my stuff to be really simple. You actually mm-hmm. learn through, whereas to me, that's just so obvious that you need to keep it simple. But yeah, at, some yeah. point, at some point, we learn it, don't we? Yeah, I totally learned. Um, so it, I always have this kind of, I call it like a blueprint. I think I got that word from you. You had one video where you talk about blueprint stuff. Um, of just a meal and I just do a starch and non-starchy veggie if I want to add a little tofu I do and then just a sauce and that's it and it doesn't have to be a complicated sauce like what do you think? so here's my question on the simplicity is sorry to cut you off no. I'll, I'll let you finish that I'm sorry it was really rude I'm done it wasn't rude I'm done. a simple sauce yeah why do people because we're talking about simplicity it's so obvious to me you know my program you know my philosophies we're totally in alignment on this I have all of my clients do simple stuff. I literally have someone write to me every day. One of my clients write to me every day saying, Ryan, I can't believe how simple this is. And I feel amazing doing it. So people don't realize it. People are, are generally speaking, being overly elaborate with their meals. Is this a is this a problem in the plant-based world or is it does it extend beyond that? Is this a vegan plant-based problem? From oh, I don't people? think. I think, a, yeah, I think this is just a cultural problem in general. I think people need, think food needs to be exactly. extravagant. And you right. know, it's so funny we're talking about this because before we got on this call, I was flipping through some reels and I saw a reel. I don't think it was like a vegan, <coughs> excuse me, a vegan reel. And it was a person talking and literally they said, do you think your food is too bland looking and boring? Here's what you should do. And it was all of these steps because they were saying that your food shouldn't look bland or boring, but yes, it should, because the more boring it is, I mean, there's so many great things for food being boring or at least looking boring or bland. I mean, it, it, that's what I strive for. Mm. My food's not looking super complicated because then I know I won't overeat. You want it to look boring. Yeah. Yes. So it was just funny that I came across that and I was like, this is the problem. It's brainwashing people to think that like they have to have these extravagant meals with all these ingredients and all these fancy sauces. Yes, I do like sauce, but super easy stuff. Well, your sauces are really simple. Your sauces are amazing, but they're the maximum five ingredients. I don't know if I've ever seen a sauce from you with more than five ingredients. Most no, of- I mean, my book, Saucy Vegan Mama, has sauces that might require like a blender and stuff. But on the day-to-day, mm. I am always mixing together low-sodium soy sauce and tahini. Mm. That is the most delicious thing I've had. Oh, not tahini, low-sodium soy sauce and nutritional yeast. Okay. Um, sometimes I, I eat... Tofu. That's how I do my tofu. Or tomato um, nutrition. That's it, just tomato. Because people yeah. always say, how do you make tofu taste good? It tastes so bland. Tamari, nutritional yeast, bake it in the oven. It's the best thing. So good. I started doing a little smoked paprika on it too. Good yeah. So good. But that's the thing. It's it's just simple. You can do... Um, sometimes I do a little tahini in soy sauce. So good. You can do all three. Um, taco sauce. That's done. Like, mm-hmm. it's just... I always have those things and mm. I'm always just kind of throwing them or topping them on my stuff and it tastes delicious. And that is it. So that's what I mean by sauce. Just, Simple. I should say maybe flavor, you know? No, yeah, that's it. Cause uh, some people, they will hear what you just said about things. You actually try to make things a little bit bland and boring. That doesn't mean tasteless. They're not the same. Mm-hmm. You're just talking about simplicity. Um, yeah. no, I think that's really good advice for, for anyone with young kids. Cause they're busy. You've got responsibilities. What about for helping their kids? What about advice to any parents, any any tips for helping parents uh, encourage their children to eat better? Yeah, I think that depends on the age of the kid. I think if your kid is, you know, um, under school age, I mean, you can just tell that child what they're going to eat. Like, I, I mean, when my kids, before my kids went to kindergarten, it was so easy for me to get them to eat healthy. They just ate what I made them and they thought it was amazing. Like my daughter would just eat salad and avocados. And, you know, um, I mean, sometimes, you know, at the time I was eating chicken and she would just eat whatever. Yeah. But once they go to school and they start to see if your kids go to school, other kids eating other things, they start to get a little attitude and, um, so I think it depends on the age for my kids who are nine and seven, um, you know, and they were at the time six and four or three. Uh, my daughter was a little easy to control with my son. Um, I would say to just, again, keep it simple and to start slowly. Like I started replacing a lot of junk food with fruits and veggies, like so easy. Kids really like fruits and veggies. If you more so fruit, if you just 
give it to them if that's all you have. And it, and I was saying a little earlier, like my kids do eat a lot of like vegan um, crackers and cookies or whatever, but we do, I don't buy that much, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't, but I am in control essentially of what comes in this house. I suppose the so, younger the child, the point you're making is the younger the child, the more authoritarian you're going to be anyway. Yeah. You just, they don't have a choice. Yes, yeah. but there is a point. I mean, still, when- if, if, if you're living in my house, like this is what I'm buying. And I'm one to not, like, I don't want my kids to feel like, um, angry is not the right word, but maybe resentful that they have to eat this way and all their friends, you know, they go to a friend's house and there's Doritos and stuff everywhere. So I'll just buy a healthier, hopefully vegan version of things that their friends have and I'll have them in the house, but I don't go overboard. I have lots of fruits and veggies. Mm -hmm. That's one thing to answer your question I would say is just um, start with lots of fruits and veggies. Mm-hmm. Espe- yeah. I think especially fruits because even for kids that are home run, they used to a lot. Yeah, of fruit, Most, yeah really, I should say start with fruit. <laughs> start with fruit more so than veggies. I th- I would argue. So obviously you want to encourage them to eat veggies, but I think fruit is the gateway to getting kids to eat better because of the sweetness. It's true, and, but I will say this: I mean, my kids do love veggies because I offer them to them, and they right. I do find they are you to train them to full. Those foods. Yeah, you just need to train the tastes. Mm. Yeah. My sorry, my dryer is like making. It's okay, noise. I can't even hear it, so I'm, hopefully it's fine uh, okay. for people watching at home. Um, the other thing I would say is, and so uh, the point I would add is, um, for anyone trying to get their kids to eat better, and obviously I don't have, as my audience knows, I don't have kids, but this is so I can't speak from personal experience, but this is something I've observed. I think, and I want your insight on it. I think it's absolutely critical that mum and dad have the same message. Because if mum's saying one thing and dad lets them off scot-free or vice versa, or when they go out the house with one parent, if that parent's taking them to McDonald's, it, and then it sort of contradicts and compromises the morals that they, they get instilled by the other parent, I think that spells disaster. It does. And I think that happens a lot because there are a lot of people, like a lot of my followers, they are the only ones eating a plant-based diet. Right. And they struggle with... Um, yeah. Yeah. And... and I mean, and I've even gone through that too. There's been many, many mornings where, you know, my husband's out going to get donuts or like, you know, and I'm like, oh, can we like dial it back? Like we, they ate really bad this week or, you know, it's just, um, it happens, but that's a great point. I think if you can be on the same page as your partner or husband or wife or whatever, um, that's, that's key. Mm. That's key, you know? Yeah. Good. No, you but, talked about, Earlier on, you mentioned tofu when you were talking about your, your sort of favorite meals at the moment. Anyone that's watched your stuff online, they'll see the avocado, they'll see the occasional nut or seed. I, I think there's a, a, a lot of, um, I don't know if a fair term is fat phobia, um, from many sort of perhaps starch solutioners. I don't think Dr. McDougall is responsible for this. I think it's more people following it. They get very scared of anything, any fat, any muck, it doesn't even have to be a fat rich plant food, any plant food that contains more than a couple of grams of fat, people get worried about. Mm -hmm. You're obviously not worried about it. Can you talk about, did you have that fear? How did you get over that? Where are you at on the dietary fat issue? Because it seems to be a bit still contentious in the- Yeah, I I mean, I never had the fear. I, and let me say this, I do watch though that I don't go overboard with fat because of my gallbladder issue. I had a, I have a big, gallstone in there. And so I do have to kind of control the amount of fat that I eat, but I still eat fat freely. And I still, to, to some extent, eat the amount of fat that I want to. Um, I just really watch, I don't eat oils. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do watch restaurant food because I I find those kind of fats affect me, but, um, I never had a big fat phobia fear. And I think it was great having you as a coach because you don't either. Um, and you, I don't want to say recommended, but but, yeah, to be very clear to anyone watching, I still, if you're not run into me, into me before, I still not to make this about me. Um, it's your interview, but I still promote a low fat diet, but this is important context. What I'm an advocate for, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you are too, is that many of these fat rich plant foods have nutrients that, 
foods without that don't contain much fat don't like the omegas for right. example omega-6 omega-3 and you can't really get those elsewhere without supplementation and also certainly for women hormonally seems to be really wise i think there's also a satiation factor having a little bit of fat in your diet more so than an ultra high carb diet i think it can really help with satiation well and i think when i you're right um i remember i was eating a bit low like i think when i started with you i was like i'm not going to eat more than 10 grams of fat a day and mm. I got to a point where I was not satisfied and we upped my fat. Um, you know, there was no magic number, but we just start, I started eating a little more tahini and a little tofu. And um, I still, to this day, don't stick to a certain number of fat. I just eat fat, healthy fat when I feel like I need it. Mm -hmm. And it's fine. I haven't gained weight. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have gallbladder problems. Well, you've lost 50 pounds eating fat-rich plant foods, which some people yes. don't need from what No, and it's crazy because I get messages all the time from people who, you know, and I can tell that they are new to the start solution or they're doing the start solution. And they'll say, like, did you did you eat all that tahini when you were lost your 50 pounds? And I'm like, yeah. yeah. You know, I wouldn't eat you know, a half a cup of tahini a day, but I would have, you know, one tablespoon of tahini throughout the day. I'd have half of an avocado. Um, if, if I had a little tofu, that's fine. And that was it. Like, I didn't go crazy. But this is what we talked about the best part of an hour ago is, it, again, I don't know if it's under talked about for, for anything, conspir any conspiratorial reasons, but there is such a lack of talk about calories. Because as you know, the bottom line is, Calorie deficit, yes, macronutrients and your your balance between carbs, protein, and fat, then those three being the macronutrients. Yes, that is important, but it's calories first. That dictates weight loss first and foremost, or weight gain or weight maintenance, of course, yeah. first and foremost. Why don't people in this community realize that? I don't know. I don't know. It's a complicated question. I've got I, I think about that quite but, frequently because yeah. I've had that thought too. I'm like, if I wanted to eat tofu all day long in tahini, what's the problem as long as I'm in a calorie deficit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it's ideal, but yeah, that's yeah. you'd still lose weight. Yeah, if I think it might come from the phrase, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. I think yeah. maybe people misinterpret that. Yes. I think, they take it, I think they take it extremely literally. Like, yes, oh, they, 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 eat fat, they get stored as fat. That's not how the body works. No. Right. I think that's, I think that could be the root cause of the problem. Yeah. No, it's far um, too, it's far too simplistic. It needs a, a full explanation for people to watch. And, and just like you said, I'm not, I don't think this came from Dr. McDougall, this, this fat phobia thing. I just think people have misunderstood some things yeah. and just gone yeah. Really I, mean, I have it every day. I think I think that's right. I think that's really important. I'm such a McDougal fan, and Me too. Even, though, even though there's one or two minor criticisms I have of the start solution, like I don't understand on his website he talks about capping fruit to three servings a day. I think that's odd. I don't think that's necessitous for the vast majority of people. Um, so even though there's one or two things I disagree with. I still overall, like what I advise is incredibly close to the start solution. And I love his work. I've got a lot of respect for him. Mm -hmm. He's changed my life. Absolutely. Me too. But I think where the problem lies is people take it is people's inability to take advice. And I might sound a bit scathing here, but I think people don't listen properly. Yeah. I think they don't. I think they hear what they want to hear or they only listen very briefly or they don't have amazing and i don't think i'm a genius but they don't have amazing critical thinking skills um and i'm gonna sound ruthless here but i'm just being honest these are my true honest thoughts and and i think you know i have messages from people every day saying ryan i'm following the starch solution and then they tell me what they're eating and i'm like you know this isn't the starch solution you're eating one baked potato and some broccoli for lunch with no toppings Right. It's, like, it's like you're eating 200 calories. This is not the starch solution. McDougall has a lot of beans in his diet. Yes, he's an advocate for potatoes, but whole grains as well. Mm -hmm. He has a far more balanced diet than a lot of the starch solution followers actually use. I don't know. If, yeah. Have you noticed that trend in your audience as well? Yes. Yeah. Right. A lot, yeah. of, lot of potatoes, which is great. I mean, I love it's potatoes. Great, but not if you're only eating potatoes and then missing out on all the other amazing nutritional diversity under this mm -hmm. um, based umbrella. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> um, <laughs> that might that might be the food stuff. I want to talk to you about exercise. You're super into. I think this is the topical thing for you at the moment. Is you've been? We haven't spoke about it for a little while. Are you are you still super into the rebounding? Because there was a time last year where you were loving that. I was. I um, 
No, I'm not into it. I'm trying to get into it. There's so, I mean, this is going to sound like a bunch of excuses, but last year when I started it, I was like all gung ho. I was like, I am going to jump on the rebounder all the time. And then I got COVID and I had to not, I literally did nothing for like two weeks and I felt very lethargic for months after. And so all I really did was walk. Um, and then I did, I did rebound a little bit more when you and I started coaching again and I felt better. Um, but I noticed, and I, it's funny, the trophy twins who are big rebounders, I know you know who they are. Yeah. I talked to them a lot about this, but I noticed after effects of COVID both times I've gotten it of joint issues. Um, and the rebounder just really has not been great with that. Um, so I'm not a big rebounder right now. It, it's kind of gotten messed up. You look like you don't like my answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm trying to listen without judgment because obviously my job as a coach is at some point I have to make judgments and I obviously have to mm -hmm. give my back an instructional client. Mm -hmm. I was trying to listen to you without judgment. I think, to be honest here, as long as you're moving your body and yeah. you're getting your, the results you want, does it really matter which kinds of exercise you use? It doesn't. So no. I, it wasn't that I was listening to you and I was about to say, oh, get on with it, Tia, get on the rebound. That, <laughs> that wasn't actually my answer. I was just thinking about it. And maybe it, maybe it is an excuse, but here's, here's where I would say uh, the real answer lies. Have you done anything else to replace it? Because if you haven't, then yeah. maybe it is an excuse. If you yeah, yeah, no, and I know it's not things, an excuse. But it's not an excuse. No, I was just saying I didn't want it to sound like an excuse. No, just walking. Um, I've always just found joy in walking. And it's funny, after the second time of getting COVID, even walking was hurting my joints. It was weird. Um, but that went away. And Good. Um, yeah, I just, just walking. I love it, but I, I do love the rebounder. I don't want it to sound like the rebounder hurts my joints or it's bad for me. I mean, it's amazing. And when I was doing it, I felt so good and it was fun. And a lot of, I, I was having a lot of good changes within my body. Um, I just got thrown off course a lot and, you know, yeah, I, mean, I think as a form of exercise, I think it's very, very underrated. I said this to you at Simon. Yeah. Time. I've, I've, I've jumped on a trampoline once or twice in my adult life. Oh yeah, uh, I loved them as a kid. They're fun. But I've, so I've never done rebounding. But I remember saying this to you, I've never done it, but I think it's brilliant. And I think it's slept on. I think it's really underrated as a form of exercise. The question I've all, and I think I said this to you at the time a year ago, when we picked back up again, and we had that second term of coaching, I... I I don't know how sustainable it is for people because you are just, and I know people that advocate for it will say, well, there's different routines. You can mix it up. You can listen to music whilst doing it. You can watch a show in the background. I get that. But is that any different to being on a treadmill? It's not really. I, I question the sustainability of that. Yeah. And I think that's part of what happened, like with, you know, with getting sick and, and feeling really tired for a couple months after, you know, walking was what I wanted to do. And then, oh, with the move, when we moved this summer, you know, I stopped rebounding because it was packed away and I couldn't find anywhere to put it. And um, then I did and I started jumping again. Then I got COVID again. Like it was just all these things. And maybe I just didn't love it enough to, to continue. To, to yeah. continue. And I just, so I, I do love walking. I, that's one thing I, I've learned about myself since getting healthy is I love to walk. I love to be outside. I love to be outside. Um, and yes, you could put the rebounder outside, but it just seems to be fun. It <laughs> no, seems more fun. Walking. You're moving, you're exploring, you breathe. It's it's just nice. Nature, I know there's some yeah, lovely yeah. areas nearby you. I remember it, certainly at your old place, you had that lovely walk nearby you, and that was great. Um, and I think I think with exercise, it's okay to go in phases. There's, there's yeah. moments, as you know, with me, there's moments where... I'm loving the tennis more so, or I'm loving the, the strength training again, or um, at the moment for me, it's this kickboxing stuff, hence the war wounds here. Like I'm just, I'm just hooked on that at the moment and I'm sure I won't be forever and it's okay to go in phases. I've played tennis on and off for, for 15 years since I was a little sprog. So there's, I've always sort of come back to it. And as long as you're doing something else in the meantime, you've replaced it with walking that you were doing walking anyway, but presumably you've upped it. I think that's fine. So, yeah, I'm not yeah. judging you for it. I do yeah. think some of it's an excuse. I've got to be honest, as I'm hearing you, I'm like, yeah, oh, I left it in the box. It's like, come on, T, come on, get it out, have a bounce. But look, if you're getting the results you want, does it really matter? Yeah, no, and I feel great. And I think it's important to 
do something that you love. And if mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I started to feel, I think like, oh, I gotta, I gotta take the rebounder out and do the rebounder. And that was making me not like, like oh, yeah. And then I was like, wait, this is not what I want moving my body to be about. I don't want to feel like a chore. Yes. And so that's when I was like, I'm being silly. Like I'm going to go do something that I want to do. Um, it's and so I do. It served its purpose for a while mm-hmm. and you may yet come back to it. So, And uh, I still actually, we set it up. It's, it's in my room and I do get on it every now and then, but it's just not a, a daily mm-hmm. thing that I wanted it to be. Um, and that's okay. You know, it happened. Mm-hmm. I forgot to ask sort of a follow-up question earlier when we were talking about the importance of calorie deficits. I think it's really important to mention that neither of us count calories. And so I think sometimes when people hear me talk about calories, they they assume I'm an advocate for calorie counting. As you know, I'm not. So I wanted to ask you, where are you at on the calorie counting thing? I presume it's it's not something, well, as I've said, you don't count calories. I know that. No, I I don't count calories. You ever go through phases where... You do because you know when you've worked with me, I've calculated them for you. But mm-hmm. have you ever gone through phases where you've looked at them recently, or are no? You just, yeah. No, I, I heard um, Chelsea Cullen explain one time, and it's just stuck with me that it doesn't matter the number. the The number does not matter. The daily number. What matters is that if you're not losing weight, you need to just eat less calories. Not eat less food, but just eat less calories. So you can manipulate your plate to do that. And after you do that consistently for a week or so, if you start to lose weight again, then you know you're yes. doing good. You don't yes. need a number. You just don't need a number. Um, you know, I, I agree with that. You don't actually need to know it. I know it for my clients for certain yeah. people. I don't tell them they don't need to know. They just have to follow their meal plan and the weight comes off. I think that's so stress relieving to not have to count and track or think mm-hmm. about it. Um, but I agree with you, like if you're, and Chelsea, therefore, by extension, if you're getting good results, why change your strategy? Yeah. If, if you're not happy with the results, if they, if, if it's going too slow, we can argue about what too slow is. But let's say if you're in a plateau and it just stops altogether, do a review, change something up. Maybe you need to shave 70, 80 calories off your daily diet. Um, but certainly don't worry about it too much if, if you're losing weight and feeling good. Yeah, and, and that's not to say people who do count calories like it's a bad thing or people who want to no, count calories. No. I just think it's a tool. It's a tool, but for someone like me, you know, when I used to count calories, I got so obsessive with it that it was a problem. And so I right. think it just depends on the person. But um, no, I don't count calories. I love not counting calories. Um, that's so much easier. Yeah. That's not to say I don't get curious and I'm like, how many calories do I even eat? You know? Um, but yeah, I just don't. No, I think the other thing, because you've already sort of hit the nail on the head with, you know, your criticism of that it's just much easier not to and, and it's enjoyable to not track everything. I think the other potential large problem with calorie counting that I see is I think for a lot of people that can distort their relationship with food where they just seeing everything in a quantitative sense rather than a qualitative I can never say that word. The three T's in it. <laughs> you did good. And for, when it comes, thank you. When it comes to food, it's. I think it's really, really important that you think about food as a source of nourishment and and think about the nutritional richness of the food you're eating, mm-hmm. not just break it down into the caloric numbers all the time. Because as much as we've just talked about the importance of calories, the nuance is that they aren't everything, and there's a lot of factors that dictate how good a food is for you beyond its caloric amount. It isn't ju- as much as we've just sung the import sung you know our battle cry about the importance of calories it's not everything yeah no yeah good um biggest limiting beliefs or fears i said we'd come to this right at the start so it's coming full circle now you look back what were the biggest not now but what were the biggest limiting beliefs or fears you've had i think we've covered a couple but about it was the carbohydrate thing for sure um i also feared i also feared failing for a while I because I had done that so much I hate to use the word failing but I had so many times throughout my life lost weight and gained it back lost weight and gained it back well, those are failure. to be really blunt with you that is failure <laughs> yeah it was to me and so I um was fearful of that but it didn't stop me so what were you fearful of specifically that happening again, presumably that you'd make all this effort, but it doesn't work. Yeah. Or it stay off. The weight doesn't stay off. Yeah. 
Because for me, I'm, I'm a very like driven person and I like to set goals and reach the goals and move past that and get a new goal. And just like, I, I love to just constantly have something I'm working towards. And when I used to try to lose weight, yeah, that felt great when I got to that goal, but then I would, yeah, I would fail at it. And so it was, a, it was a fear I had of like, just, yeah, failure. Um, that was a big one. When do you remember that? Or maybe you don't, but when do you remember that stopping? Do you remember a, a period of time where that seemed to go away? Was it just as you lost weight and it, as you saw that it wasn't going back on, that's when you got more confident that you would never need to Yeah, do you remember, or? do you remember one, I don't know if this is, you, you coach so many people since me, but there was a number of one. I'll never forget you, Tia, my dear. Well, I remember you. One, I, 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 for some reason, I wanted to get past 178. No, not 178. Oh, yes, this rings a bell. Maybe it was 178. Maybe I was maybe 190. Was. I think I was 190 when I started coaching with you. So maybe it was 178. That rings a bell. For some reason, I, ever since having kids, would diet and... And I don't consider eating this way a diet, but I would diet, get to 178, and then it would just come back to 190. And it was just like this fluctuating thing. And I was very fearful that I just wasn't go. it was going to happen again. And so, yes, to answer your question, I think once it went past 178, I remember we kind of celebrated. I remember. Um, yeah. And it was so easy. And it just kept going. That was when I really let go. And I was like, this is for real. Right. This is, this is real. This time. Yeah. That's and when it was. So that was 178 was your glass ceiling. That's probably the best mm -hmm. way to describe it. And when you mm -hmm. smash through it, you're like, well, anything's possible now. Do you think, um, how do you look back at that 178 now? I can't help but laugh. I don't mean to laugh at you. I laugh because you, you, you would not believe the amount of conversations I've had over the years where clients will say, oh, I can never get past 152 as if a, a given number is the reason that at the point where their body stops and it just becomes so stubborn, as if your body knows exactly what your weight is, and then it stops, right. <laughs> right? So do you look back at that and do you laugh? Do you go, that was silly? Or do you think that, do you think it was like a time thing? Do you think it was always that you could only ever stay on track for, for example, two weeks, and two weeks was about the time it took to get around 178? So there was a reason why. Yes. Do you, like, how do you look back at it? I think I, I think both of what you said. I think it right. was silly for me to believe that I could never get past 178. Right. Um, but I do, you know, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head with that. I do think that was why probably I could never get past 178 is because I wasn't giving anything a chance right. long enough to do that. Yeah, impatient. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's interesting. I never thought about that, but... I think yeah. we have, like, we, we have, like, I, I joke about this all the time. I always see, a lot of people have this. There's a time. They always recognize a time. And for me, it's, you know what I'm going to say? For me, it's 2121. I always notice it. And I swear this time, for the last 15 years of my life, I remember it being a little kid. I can yeah. see 2121 in every clock in my parents' house. <laughs> and it's the time that I swear has haunted me all my yes. life. Every time I look at my phone, every time I look at my watch, it's 2121. <laughs> um, and of course, it's completely untrue. Yeah. And it's like a confirmate, or it's a number bias that I've built up over the years. And because I've, like, jokingly, because it's a joke to me, but because I've, like, jokingly sort of acted like it's superstitious, I now recognize it everywhere. It's just a, a recognition thing, a pattern mm -hmm. recognition number bias do you think that's what 178 was for you do you think that actually there were times where you gave up at 180 or 181 or maybe even 176 maybe you even got past it but you sort of for you it, you only remember the times really clearly when it was 178 because you built up this number on a pedestal do you absolutely know absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah i think that's important for people at home here because people generally a lot of folks do think they've got a glass ceiling when it comes to weight loss I think it's very important to hear that some of these things can just be, you, you, it might just so happen that you always do stop at 178, but it might also be that you only recognize it because this number holds such weight, pardon the pun, in your mind. <laughs> it haunts you, it haunts me. It haunts you. So yeah. big limiting beliefs, 178, fear of failure, carb phobia, anything else you'd add to this, this list? No. That's a good that's list. Probably it. Yeah. Impatience is uh, maybe it's not fear or a limiting belief, but that's obviously a mental obstacle that held you back as well. The impatience you spoke yeah. about that throughout. 
Yeah, okay. We're coming to the end now. Um, I think I do have more questions, but I've done these in such a funny order. Oh, yeah, just a couple of rapid fire things. Just so people at home have a little bit of inspiration if they want to go away, they've heard your fantastic story and they're like, right, time to do this, time to turn my life around. Top three healthy plant-based meals that you're loving right now. Oh, um, I'm really into noodles. Um, yeah, really into noodles. So for me right now, I um, actually just, just released a video yesterday on YouTube about my top three favorite meals I'm eating right now, but they're just, um, they're just, I, noodles. I didn't know that. one <laughs> so of them, I, I yeah, it was my, top, the video. Yeah. my top three favorites. So I guess, you know, if you want to go watch it, you can, but, um, I'm definitely into noodles and rice dishes right now, but, uh, but I would say to further answer that question, even though that probably, I didn't even really answer your question. Um, a top dish I would recommend for people just starting would be like a, an easy sushi bowl, you know, that's that's always a favorite of mine. It's so easy, just rice, edamame, cucumbers, yeah, and carrots. Years, I remember you having that years ago. Yeah, so much. Um, taco bowls, so easy. Like lots of lettuce and beans and rice and corn. Um, you can add anything in there, but those two for sure. Like, oh. I, I still have in my weekly rotation. Like, I just can't get enough of it. Uh -huh. And again, we can hear this, uh, that whole message. We talked about it half an hour ago. We don't need to go there again, but simplicity. You can hear it in all of those dishes, folks. Tia's just mentioned. Simple stuff. Three or Some of those things, three or four ingredients plus a sauce, 15, 20 minutes cooking time. Less. A lot of them less. Not even. Five. Right. I would say five to ten minutes. Like maybe. a ramen is really quick, isn't it? Like I love it. Yeah. Really when I'm getting noodles, I'm real into ramen right now. Like, yeah. so into it. Yeah, I always see that on your Instagram. I, and like, can't stop. <laughs> Speaking of which, you obviously you dropped that um, uh, Five Habits video last week and all this last week or so on Instagram, I've been seeing them, I've been liking them and it's given me ideas about what I can eat because I still watch other people, even though I've been doing this for so long. I still think, oh, that's a cool dish tea is making. I used to like something like that. It's a reminder, like, oh, I should try that. Yeah. And I think after this, you've honestly, oh, you, you've said noodles a few times. Like, I'm honestly now thinking, mm, I should do ramen again. I have made it for years. So you just get inspiration from everywhere, no, uh, no matter how long you've been doing this. But anyway, sorry to cut to the chase. So I've been seeing on Instagram your this 90-day challenge. Have you got any idea how many people are doing this with you? Because that would be cool to know. Oh, are you talking about that 100-day? Sorry, sorry, I read the comment. Day. Everyone was, like, there was a lot of people commenting. But do you have any idea how many people are doing it? Are you talking about the 50-50 plate thing? Yeah, the 90-day challenge you're doing to, to get people to eat more food. Um, it's there. 100 days. Mm. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know how many people are doing it. And I don't mean to say this to be rude, but I'm doing it for myself, not any other people. But <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think yeah, it's I, I need to get, get, mm. I'm doing it. I mean, I want, of course, to um, be inspiring to other people and show them that this is so easy and so possible and just take it day by day. That's why I'm doing this um, is because I want to show people like if you have this big goal, you got to take it day by day. And before you know it, you're there. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many people I know there's a couple people that are doing it that have reached out and said, I'm doing it. I mean, my first post, I think a lot of people commented and said they wanted to do it too. And I love that. I love that, you know, I can motivate them and inspire them to, eat more veggies. Um, but essentially I'm, I'm doing it for myself. I'm posting it, um, to keep my mind focused on the day to day. Well, it's accountability and for you, isn't it? Cause you know, it's you're accountability for me yeah. from you. Yeah. Cause I've gotten, I've gotten a bit away from eating so many veggies, um, mm. and even fruit, you know, and I think a lot of that we were talking earlier has to do with just the cookbook. Um, and making all these, you know, meals every day and tasting them, you know, and then, you know, for me, I get full really quick. And so just two, two bites of a dish will throw me off. And mm -hmm. I just got out of the habit of three, you know, big filling meals. And so I'm, I'm trying to consistently eat that way again. Um, mm. I mean, I do for the most part, but no, no, you're just making a conscious, you've noticed the veggies and yes. fruits flipping, so you've said, right, what sort of commitment can I do? And you've got public accountability for it. Yeah. Like you said, primarily this is for you, but I also think this could be, I think there's another advantage to this. Like you say, you can inspire a lot of people with it. I think mm -hmm. I saw the amount of comments you got on your YouTube video, and I'm sure I didn't check the first Instagram post you did. I didn't read the comments, but I'm sure 
that number will tail off as the 100 days goes on. As oh, yeah. But I just think it'd be, you know, this is just my two cents. I think it'd be really cool for you to get a gauge on how many people are actually doing it with you. And I know, again, it is primarily for you, but it'd be cool at the end of 100 days for you to get flooded with DMs of how much weight people have lost or how much their cholesterol has dropped. Or, But obviously you didn't want to make it like a really formal thing because you know how my, work, my mind works. I'm thinking, oh, I'll, give, I'll email everyone like a, a spreadsheet and put their weight in and then we'll get the feedback at the end. We'll do a live stream. I'll bring people. That's how my mind works. You're primarily doing this for you. So I don't need to project my opinions onto you. But yeah, I love it. you're welcome to know how people that did it with you will do with it. Yeah, maybe I keep in touch with them. Um, I mean, it is quite a bit, but maybe I could start a Facebook group. That's something I didn't think about. People mm, can that would be cool. know, chat in there. That would be easier yeah. to communicate. But um, cool. yeah. yeah, I think there's quite a bit of people who, who want to do it, you know, or who well, are doing it. What's next for the Hungry Vegan Mama movement? More YouTube Healthy, healthy. I've never changed it. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Sorry, T. Sorry. Healthy. I, I caused that that's, myself. No, that's sloppy of me, though, because it's been um, changed for a long time. But what's next? Uh, any cookbooks in the in the works? I don't know. I really would like to do a pub, like be published, get a published book. Um, mm. So I'm working on just growing my following because I think that's like a requirement. Um, and working on new recipes always. Easy, easy recipes. Um, I don't know, really. I don't, I don't know. I have a couple ideas always going on in my mind, always. Um, but I haven't like fully hammered one down. Like I'm going for this yet. Um, you enjoy, cause it's been a long time since I made a cookbook or, or wrote a book. Cause I'm just so focused on, on obviously on vegan, slim and sustain. Do you, and my memory is so it's years ago, but like I have such bittersweet memories of like writing stuff and producing that sort of stuff and writing a cookbook and so on and so forth. Where are you at with it? Do you love it? Do you love that whole process? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> this last one was a bit of a beast. So yeah. it, it took me so long. I, I do like it, mm. but because I do everything myself. I edit my videos. I film my videos. I, I mean, I don't have any help. I'm not saying that cause I need help. Um, I feel like it's, it's just another thing that I'm doing that I have to do myself. And so, um, you know, this summer when I really was in the beginning of, of last year throughout the summer, when I was really trying to get this book finished, it was a beating, um, so I think that's why I'm not working on anything right now. I'm just taking a break from it. It's a lot. I don't think people realize how much actually goes into incredibly draining and it a takes your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's a lot. It's so much. Um, and that's why I get so many comments like, well, why won't you, why won't you put it on Amazon and sell it? And it's like, I, if I'm being honest, like for the printing that Amazon charges and the, and the royalties, like I get three bucks. And for all of that work I did, it's not worth it for me. Like you, get, you can, you, you can buy books. the ebook and, and print it out on your home computer. You get three books per sale if you sold it as hard copy via Amazon. Yeah. Well, my simple vegan mama was, I got about $3, maybe $4. Um, well, because you terrible. know, it's so colorful and I, if I'm going to do it, I want good you quality want stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's so terrible, it's just, though, isn't it? Yeah. That's why I would love to have a book like with a publisher. Mm. Um, hint, anyway. hint for anyone watching, yeah. Uh, yeah, so or or hint if anyone's good. watching, yeah. Okay. But anyway, that's yeah, that's, that's kind of what's going on. I'm just kind of in, in a little bit of a limbo right now, I'm just feeling things to... out. It doesn't feel like a limbo. It, it sounds pretty yeah. clear. It sounds like you need a rest from sort of producing any any new books or any resources. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're just focused on sort of Instagram and YouTube. Are you still, yeah. this is now turned into a personal chat, but people might be interested. Oh, I'm curious. Are you still, because I go through phases with YouTube videos and Instagram. I'm loving it right now. Where are you at? Are you still passionate about it, enjoying it? I think I'm, I'm, I'm on the uptick with YouTube again. Um, I had a quite a bit of a hiatus. Yeah, you had a break. I really got burnt out with YouTube. Was that, was and, and again, YouTube? it's because I, I don't have an editor. You know, I I don't, I, I film myself and I have to fit this in a window because, you know, I got, I volunteer at my kid's school all the time and then I got to go pick them up and I don't like to film while they're here. It's just, yeah. 
you know, it, a lot of it is my own um, box that I put myself in, but that's the box that I live in and I'm okay with that. You know, I don't want my kids seeing me on my phone or, or filming YouTube videos. And some people don't care about that, but um, I do. So. Well, that makes sense. When you're with them, you want to be with them. You want to be yes. present. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I think for me, like George has really helped. And uh, like he's, I don't know, I don't think we've ever talked about this, but I started working with George, my photographer, videographer, like about March last year. And it's been a massive help. It's cost me an arm and a leg, but it's it's been a huge help to, like I still have to put a lot of stuff together. I still make content, like most of my content, but just having him there, to at least film or to at least film one in three of my YouTube videos or to at least help me record, you know, five out of 10 of my Instagram posts or take the photos. It, it's a little help. Um, and it, it has been worthwhile. I know. So. I probably should. I have so many friends like YouTube friends and Instagram friends who, who have help and they tell me all the time, like it is amazing, you know? And, um, I don't know. I'm such a controller. I need to let go a little bit, I think, um, mm -hmm. if I plan on growing anymore and doing, right. you know, because I want to keep up with it. But yeah, to answer your question, I really am starting to kind of get excited about YouTube again. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love Instagram reels, though, if I'm being honest. Like, yeah, they're fun. It's so easy. I can, I can oh, whip yeah. out six of them in a day and just post them. Yeah. And if you haven't made a YouTube video before, I think most people, they don't realize the effort. And it's not just, film, it's filming is half the job and filming's tough and filming is very tiring and draining. And you have to be, we talked about it before we went live today. You have to be focused, game face on, and you're not always in the mood. Um, that's just filming. Then you've got to edit, thumbnail, title, da -da, and some some of them you think what well, you think you've made something amazing, something really helpful. And, and no one watches well, it. It's like, it's a nightmare. So it's very, it's, it feels very um, mentally um, unstable <laughs> producing YouTube videos. And if you're too, <laughs> you're too attached to good feedback. YouTube's not for you, <laughs> is what I would say. That's yeah. one thing I had to learn, like, pretty, pretty early on is to, like, not let comments bother me or, like, anything. I mean, that was, that was tough at first. But now it's like, I don't even... Yeah. Sometimes I don't even look at the comments. I try yeah. because I do love that part of interacting with people because it's social media. But um, after I would say a day or two, especially if a video starts to really get a lot of views, I usually just don't even look at that point. Yeah. Mine basically depends how busy I am. I'll reply. Yeah. You'll see me on some videos. I reply to every comment on others. I haven't touched one. And it's all, yeah. it's all a busyness thing. It's not rudeness. I just sometimes yeah. if I'm really busy. I don't have to. It's one of those things that's slightly lower down on my priority list. Just being honest. Yeah. I don't always get to it. Um, where can people find more of your stuff? Most people already know, but your recipes, your, your cookbooks. Yeah. Other um, Instagram, you know, at healthy dot vegan dot mama, um, YouTube, same thing. Um, I'll put them below. Vegan, mama. I'll put them below. Yeah. My website, healthy VM, not to be confused with healthy BM. Someone mentioned that one time. No one I was like, that. oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I have all kinds of recipes on there for free and my eBooks, but yeah, that's it. I mean, cool. you can just Google my name and it'll pop up. Google healthy. Well, well, uh, anything else you want to talk about? I think that's it. We've covered a lot. I think we've covered been, a lot. A lot of time. So thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's always fun to talk to you it and is. see you, you know, like see you face to face. Yeah. It's weird because it's the relationship we've had. It's, it's gone from coaching to, to friends um, and people know that there's a connection between us as well. So other people like to hear, like people, when, when people hear I, I talk about you, they get really interested in that. If, in YouTube videos and whatnot, where I've mentioned you, people get curious about that. I think it's same. the same. Thing I think it's the same. So people like that we've got a little connection. And a lot of people won't realize it. And they're, oh, okay, right. So for the first time watching us. so um, but yeah. and, and, and to add to that, I love to share a lot, obviously, because you are my friend now. And I love, to, I just love, everything you do and what you've done for me. And obviously I love to share that, but also I love sharing that I needed help. You know, yeah. I, I feel like that's not seen a lot with a lot of the influencers out there, you know, like, Oh, they've done it all on their own, which is awesome. You think that's I an egotistical thing. Why people don't talk about, it. they don't want, they're too embarrassed to say I had help. 
Do you think it's that? I think that could be, or I think maybe they didn't need help, but I did. And I think there's a lot of people that do. And they, yes, they are afraid to say that they need help. Um, so I like to talk about it. I, and I'm not afraid to talk about it. Mm. You know, I love to take credit and say that, oh yeah, well, I continue to lose weight on my own and I know what I'm doing now, but in the beginning, like I needed help mm. and that's okay. When my clients start with me, I've got this, it's a document called the commitment code and any clients watching, they'll be laughing as I'm talking about this. And at the bottom of the commitment code, it's sort of a commandments list for habits that my best clients engage in, things my best clients do. I will reach out to Ryan. I will. And one of them is I'll run towards you and not away from you when I'm stuck or when I'm struggling as in yeah. towards me. And I think it sounds so obvious to ask for help. But I think there is something internal that prevents us, the, the shame, the sense that we're being openly vulnerable to maybe, a, for me anyway, a stranger on the Internet. When a client's just met me, it's understandable that they don't have 100 percent trust in me just yet. And hopefully I earn that very quickly. And I think I do. But it's understandable that they're a bit apprehensive. And so mm -hmm. I think that's a really cool thing to finish on, actually, just that message of now nah, it's cool to ask for help. In fact, it's worse to not if you're really struggling with something. Yeah. Um, and it's, it is egotistical to, to not say, you know what, I'm struggling, let me go and find some advice, whether it's free or paid. That's almost egotistical at the end of the day, because you're suggesting that you can solve everything and that you're so perfect in every domain that no one else can give you good advice. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Thank you very much, Tia. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, it's been Speak fun. Soon.